So hello everybody and welcome to today's author interview. We're doing another interview um, in connection with the conference My Poor Devil, which is 100 years of Georgette Hayes' The Black Moth. And we're going to be joined today by Olivia Waite, who is one of our authors on the Queering Hair panel. And I'm going to let her introduce herself and introduce her work. And I also have the props with me to show you while she's talking. Well, hi everyone. I'm Olivia Waite. I write historical and fantasy romance, and lately I write queer historical specifically. It's been really fun. I've been a Regency and a romance reader for most of my life. And so um, I actually started writing queer romance because I started reading queer romance, specifically FF and sapphic romance. And that was part of kind of um, my journey to recognizing myself as a queer woman, as a bisexual woman. And so a lot of this is how I engage with, because, you know, I was, by the time I discovered FF romance, I was actually happily married to Mr. Waite, who is spectacular and wonderful, but I still wanted to engage with this part of my identity that I'd kept kind of under wraps for so long. And queer romance is absolutely a wonderful way to do that, especially because for me, growing up as a romance reader, engaging with romance was a way of kind of testing out relationships that I wasn't in. So it's all very personal, but it's artistic. It's a lot of moral judgments and questions. And it's it's been really nice to be able to work out a new identity discovery in a way that's also uh, familiar and known, but still feels exciting and fresh and revelatory. Awesome. And yeah, that's more broadly about my work. Uh, specifically, I've just wrapped up the Feminine Pursuits trilogy with the latest, The Hellions Waltz, which is a historical sapphic heist romance. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be reading that for our book club. So if anybody's interested in October, give me a shout. You can come and join us and read and chat about it. Um, the other two books in the Feminine Pursuit um, series, could you, could you introduce those to us as well? Or give us an idea of their contents. Oh, yes. So the first one is Lady's Guide to Celestial Mechanics. It's a story of a widowed countess and an astronomer who team up to do a translation of a French mathematical text. And it kind of deals with uh, women's erasure from history and scientific history in particular. It deals with art versus science, whether they're opposed or not, and how to kind of create a life in a world that doesn't leave an obvious place for you. The second one, The Care and Feeding of Waspish Widows, is probably my deepest dive historically. It is um, a beekeeper, a married beekeeper and a widowed printer. And the beekeeper is married to a queer man who's in love with her brother and they're off whaling. And in the meantime, she is free to make her own connections. And it's about um, community and, you know, two middle-aged women, one of whom is a mother, kind of finding, finding each other after they think kind of the most exciting part of their life should be over, but of course it isn't. And it's about how to be a person among other people, which sound very sexy, obviously. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's a wonderful slow burn and it's full of bees and six different types of gardens. And I just, I love it so much. I love all of them for different reasons, but uh, yeah. I mean, slow burn is definitely the word for it. <laughs> oh yeah. You're going to be on like the edge of your seat <laughs> waiting for it's very come like, on you'll say touch kind of <laughs> robot so yeah my poor yourself. editor my poor editor was like <laughs> seriously 70 percent, and i'm like it might be 80 and she goes no 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 <laughs> i mean i i loved it the what i really enjoyed about it was the different stages of their relationship which you really had time to explore the letter writing at the beginning. I'm not giving away spoilers here, but how they become sort of moving from acquaintances to friends is this whole kind of epistolary romance, yeah. essentially. Still. And that's how, it, that's how it started is I wanted to write a friends to lovers, but they didn't know each other. They weren't friends yet. And I'm like, okay, well, like, they have to become friends first. Like, and they're not really, they're neither of them really thinking about romance. So it doesn't really, it kind of creeps up on them both separately. So it, that, to do that well takes time. Um, Hellion's Waltz is enemies to lovers and they're like hate making out in chapter three so it's like kind of the opposite change of pace <laughs> yes. well I mean I never I never have the same pacing in a book I can't I, I can't seem to do it like 
some people like to write steady pacing and they get the they get into a rhythm as an author and I love to see it. I cannot handle that. You give me two different characters and I'm like, ah, oh, obviously we're doing a waltz now and then an allegretto later. So, you know. I mean, I I feel like the books reflect so well the romance. I mean, that sounds obvious, but the the romances are so individual and the books, the pacing of that matches it so well. I mean, I, you know, there's various things that I really love about your work, but there's a couple of things off the bat, which are the things that people keep asking for and are perhaps a little bit more difficult to find. So Regency FF is a little bit more difficult to find than mm -hmm. MM or um, MF, for example. Older heroines um, who are not falling in love for the first time, love a bit of that. Um, and I love the kind of rooting as well in a particular, a, a very specific historical moment, which you create so wonderfully, but is quite different from the Regency world that we perhaps know from from Heyer. Um, and and yeah, and I think I think part of my journey as an author over the course of this trilogy has been moving away from that, and partly that's because. Um, with Ladies Guide, I kind of gave myself free reign to put in as much stuff as I liked. And I started to do all of this really in-depth research. Um, I got myself a JSTOR subscription for the first time since grad school. And so suddenly I had all this more material to work with. And I threw in a bunch of things and there was way too much for one book, which is how it became a trilogy. And I'm, I'm not even close to running out of material. I keep saying someday I'm going to write a whole romance set in like a Regency era utopian commune. And people are going to be like, what is this nonsense? This is not a Regency. This is completely made. And I'm like, no, these people were like buying whole neighborhoods and trying to live in like perfect gender equality. And it never really panned out. Yeah. But like, you could write such a great romance about about this community trying to come together and then like completely falling apart. Yeah. And it would be it would be historically accurate and it would be completely unlike anything you've seen on the market. It would be really interesting. I mean there's so there's so much to explore still in the Regency which you know everybody loves that kind of hair world. Sure, but there's so much else going on and you know so I work in the 18th century and the early 19th but there's so many random bits of history that I just I'm like please somebody yeah. <laughs> please write this for me <laughs> <laughs> I need it to be so um <laughs> so what was sort of your um your introduction to Regency and how did your how did you sort of develop your relationship with it that you were wanting to write books that were sort of slightly different perhaps or um, I mean, often your books are, are dealing with a different social class or different parts of the social class than we're used to kind of knowing or working with. So what was that journey for you? Well, I think I, I actually don't remember what the first Regency I ever read was. Uh, I think I started with the Gothics, actually. I think Victoria Holt kind of segued me into things like Higher and um, MC Beaton, but she writes her Regencies under a different name and I forget what it is. Um, but I was like, you know, I was a kid with a library card, just scraping the shelves for anything Regency or like romance adjacent that I could find, um, which was much harder then than it is now. Like when you were really limited by what was physically on the shelf, it was a whole different kind of ball game. You had to kind of do things like, like, I think, I think that's where a lot of the, the fanfic impulse came for a lot of people in my, in my age range, because you couldn't find precisely what you were looking for. There was no AO3 to go sorting through. So you had to kind of imagine it existing in these margins. So anything you did find, if it wasn't quite what you could kind of see what see what you really wanted through it, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I think with higher in particular, I was looking, I was looking for a very particular kind of lens. Like there was always something frustrating about her to me. Um, even though I read I read Devil's Cub and Sebastian like over and over and over for a period of about two years, like just constantly. Sylvester? Yeah, Sylvester, not Sebastian. Okay. Yeah. I was like, is that an Amer I didn't know if there was an American title. For no, no, no. One no, that's, title. that's me being terrible with names. <laughs> like 2020 and 2021 are the year where I cannot remember names. Yeah. So um, it is Sylvester. Um, and it's Devil's Cub and everything with. 
um, you know, the ship and the kidnapping and when she shoots him, loved it. Absolutely loved it. But weirdly, like, I'm not sure if my library didn't have them or if I had moved on because at some point I discovered signet regencies and the category romances. And, um, and those were like much more the kind of thing I wanted from a regency romance. Mm. And then I discovered paranormal signet regencies and then I was kind of off to the races. But the really, so one of the really big revelations for me was a like Regency romance. And I'm like, yes, yes, this is good. This is Pride and Prejudice-y because I'm sure I grew up watching Pride and Prejudice. And, um, and some of those older, like, no, that was 95. So I didn't grow up watching it. It just feels that way. <laughs> um, but before then you had, uh, for me, one of the big revelatory moments is a writer named Karen Harbaugh. And she put out a bunch of paranormal regencies, like The Vampire Viscount is one of her titles. Amazing. She did a whole trilogy um, that imagined the Greek gods were living in Regency England and having like romances with humans. And it's like Cupid's uh, hanging out with this human family. Uh, and they have like a bunch of daughters and siblings and the little baby girl whose name is Psyche because her dad is such a professor nerd um gets a hold of the cupid's darts and causes trouble for her brothers and then it like progresses in time and psyche is actually the heroine of book three and the hero is cupid it is a cupid psyche reincarnation romance where like is she the real psyche um there's all of these like kind of mythological things it's I just remember sitting there reading this going, I didn't know you were allowed to do this. This is amazing. Because I was also super obsessed with the Greek myths as a kid. So this was like, just this huge, like opening up of a, of a new world for me. And I think, I think that made, that may be possibly the most influential thing I've ever had happen as a reader. The idea that, oh, you can just do the things you want with the words in the book. You can just you can actually do this and yeah and there's a there's a part of me that will never recover from that so do you do you write paranormal regency as well i or have yeah you have uh i actually did yeah i did um the first one the working title was the eurydice clause but when it was published it came out as damned as you do damned if you do and it's a uh it's now bundled there's two of them um it was it started as like an Orpheus Eurydice type riff and then it ballooned into the well ballooned it's two novellas so hardly a ballooning but it's two novellas that are now bundled together as um something called happily ever after lives and in the first one you have a demoness in hell and she is assigned she's just been promoted to a knight of hell and she's she's assigned to punish uh, the soul of a lord who died on the battlefield and has been condemned to hell for lust and of course it's an erotic paranormal historical. There is much banging all around. <laughs> they fall in love. His human fiance actually comes down into hell playing a terrible violin to try and rescue him. She's found like a grimoire that tells her how to do this. And so Satan finds her so irritating. He actually sends the Lord back up with her. Just, just take him and go basically. Um, and then it's how is he going to be reunited with the demoness that he's fallen for in the meantime and it's all very it's very like Pratchett inspired it's very comedic it's not actually very angsty and dark um, so but yeah how are they going to be reunited wait are they immortal now what happens to the fiance she's actually the heroine of book two she finds one now that she's like bent literally to hell and back she um she finds she's seeing demons everywhere, like in the ballroom, whispering in the Duke's ears and like just doing their best to create sin and temptation everywhere. But her soul has been banned from hell forever. So even if she sins, she's not going to suffer for it. But it's really awkward. She can't make small talk when there's all of these unseen people everywhere. And then an incubus walks into the ballroom. And then it's, of course, like their romance. And what does that mean? And I am so proud of this weird little book. I can't even tell you. It's like... It was the first time I ever actually sobbed when writing an ending. And I'm like, this is my Joan Wilder moment. And it's very strange. And I'm so proud of it still all these years later. They're like, they're strange little books. And they were, they were strange little books when they came out. So I think I've always had kind of an, 
an offbeat kind of sensibility. And even when I thought I was writing like straight regencies with your lords and ladies and aristocracy, I was always trying to like give people jobs. And I was always trying to kind of like have something be a little offbeat, like, you know, okay, yeah, he's a, he's an Earl's son, but also what if he's a painter and he's really into this one particular paint color, you know? So there's, there were seeds of this kind of thing everywhere. And then with uh, the Feminine Pursuits trilogy, I just, threw myself into it and yeah it's a it's a good place for me it's you know balancing the research and the story is always it's helped by the fact that I'm impatient <laughs> I hit like um I know Rose for instance is one of the most thorough researchers I have ever met in my life she will pick a topic and just literally read every book she can get her hands on about it and I usually tap out about five books in <laughs> and I'm like yeah this is this is good enough anyways I need I need I need the new topic I need the next thing so, I mean, it, there's so much research going on in these. And I think what's interesting is how specific you are. And I think that sort of, you know, like spe a very specific moment in beekeeping history yes. <laughs> that, you know, is in great detail in the book and is it's legitimately just fascinating. I'm like, okay, I mean, there's a romance going on, but also tell me more about these, <laughs> about these hives. Um, We're so... Like, and that's the fun part is discovering all these little things and the book kind of builds itself out of this constellation of stuff that I find so it's a very magpie kind of a thing so like the beekeeping in particular as soon as I stumbled over Francis Huber's leaf hive the one that opens out and looks like a book and I'm like are you kidding me with this like this is real people are gonna think I'm just making this up <laughs> but I'm like of course I have this printer like publisher figure and of course the beekeeper has a hive looking like a book and like you know it's this it's this wonderful image that you understand the meaning without me having to actually put it in words and I'm like yes this is this is amazing and there's still like my greatest regret with waspish widows is that we didn't in 18 in 1820 we didn't know about bee dances I really wanted to like do the whole thing about bees communicating through dance and gesture. And I'm like, they didn't know that then. They didn't, it's way too early. You can't do it. You just cannot do it. Uh, I mean, it feels like a sequel is due. <laughs> like, I don't know if those ladies would be there to see it though. I don't know. No, I, I forget when the discovery was. I try, when I'm researching, I try to only research like things. If I, if I research like, the whole reality of what we know then I end up interpolating things from later eras without meaning to so I try to only like research up until a moment um yeah that that makes a lot which of sense doesn't always work but yeah I did have a one review a lady's guide once where somebody was very upset she goes I don't know why she thinks astronomers did this I don't know where she got this idea that this is what astronomers do and I'm like well, they don't do it now. <laughs> this is what they did then. I mean, I'm, I'm literally cribbing from Mary Somerville and Carolyn Herschel's like comet sweeps. It's, it's pretty established. This is literally what people were doing as astronomers in order that we could do the astronomy now that we're doing now. Mm -hmm. Like, and I just, you know, I'm just like, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that didn't make you happy, but like, no <laughs> like... I mean what what is the sort of what are the research hangovers that you have things that you want to to dive into now that you maybe touched upon and couldn't go into when you were doing your research was there anything like that oh there's always there's always something like that um uh the utopian commune is probably the biggest one because I was reading quite a bit about those and I actually have I have one book that I'm really excited about that's about like utopian experiments in the late 19th century in the Pacific Northwest where I am. And so there's that, there's some I know on the East Coast, there's some in Regency England. And I really, this is from uh, Hellion's Waltz, but I really wish I, I had the, the time and the, and honestly the resources because uh, library research in the age of COVID is not, a, it's a it's a non-starter like there's one particular um source that is in a library minutes away from where i live and i cannot go see it because nobody's allowed in the library for like a year and a half and i'm like i will just have to do without 
that is just that is just the perils of being an independent researcher with no academic affiliation is you're limited in your access for a lot of things and especially as somebody in the united states research, researching um english history there's a lot of things where i'm like nope I don't get that newspaper archive, you know, unless I lay out like a hundred pounds or however much the Times archive is charging these days. That's but um, yeah, there's there's always something, and there's always there's always things I'm like, kind of continually researching that end up in future book. So um, yeah, like right now it's. These are not all for the same book, but I'm going to list them all at once and you can guess which ones go together. But it's chickens, atomic bombs, ballet, Cold War espionage, um, the Manhattan Project, um, jewelry history, Birmingham, and uh, the arts and crafts movement and the pre-Raphaelites. Which Birmingham? Like British Birmingham? or British Birmingham, yeah. Oh, intriguing. <laughs> yes. um, one of the other things you said or mentioned about your work is um, the, particularly with Waspish Widows, that kind of placing people in community and kind of building the world out a little bit. And there was lots of like classic characters that um, in Waspish Widows particularly that kind of stuck out with quite small parts. I'm still slightly traumatized by the vicar and the wing clipping. Oh God, yeah. Such an evocative and awful, awful image. I, I found that in some beekeeping manual from the time and I'm like, oh my God, I hate you. That's going in. Like, yes. <laughs> yeah. But how did you sort of is that a really important part of your world building generally for you to kind of build up a world? And are you trying to build up a world that you can then connect back to in, in future novels? Because I noticed there was a little bit of crossover between the first two books. Oh yeah, and you're gonna, you're gonna see even more of that in book three. Book three kind of has like bits from the whole. Um, it's, oh, it makes me so happy. But uh, I think part of it is because I come partly from like a fantasy, paranormal, sci-fi, kind of background um and in particular like big fantasy series like Pern and the Mercedes Lackey books and my god Discworld Discworld is like written on my bones at this point um the idea that you could have like a lot of people really like it when their romance telescopes in and you get these really deep dives into two particular people and like the angst and the back and forth and you could do really interesting work there and that is that is actually not the kind of work I do. I like having two particular people and then you see kind of the shapes that form around them. My my greatest habit as a reader and a writer is I fall in love with secondary characters, like all the time, pretty much constantly. I fall in love with my own, I fall in love with other people's, um, like, oh, just everybody. Um, but Rose Lerner, KJ Charles, Kat Sebastian's, all of, all have just such wonderful secondaries. Zen Cho, obviously, oh my gosh. Like Sorcerer to the Crown. Um, and this is where my inability to remember names, um, but he's the Birdie Wooster dragon. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I, yeah. I know who you mean, but yes, uh, is he, also lost is the he name. Rolled, rolled or Ronnie? Roland? No. Roland, thank you. Yeah, again, like name. I'm like, yes, no, he's he's the one who, yeah. Um uh I recently read Alexis Hall's uh boyfriend material, and he has a side character named Alex Twaddle, who I would have I, I want a whole series of books with just Alex Twaddle not solving mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> and so so because I like the secondaries, you can get a bit more you get a bit more latitude with secondaries like heroes and heroines have to be um at least at least for me like and this is something i'm also kind of maybe trying to break down but people expect certain qualities from heroes and heroines and the secondaries can be a little bit goofier or looser or more comedic they don't have to be as perfect um and i don't mean perfect in the sense of flawless but i mean like Romance tends to like its heroes and heroines to have one big flaw that they work through over the course of the plot. Um, 
you can't be just like, you can't, maybe I'm not expressing this well. I do feel like it's something to do with, with comic types and with like, um, this is a weird place to go, but you know, in Mad Max Fury Road, yes. there's the whole subplot with Nux and yes. he falls in love with Capable and they have that whole romance and like, and then he's able to actually do the big sacrifice meaningfully that he was doing kind of hollowly in the beginning. And like, man, that is, that is exactly the kind of thing I'm going for, but it, you almost can't do it as a main romance. It almost has to be a secondary romance. It has to be like subtle and specific and they're not, they're not being held up as heroic the way that Max or Furiosa are. They're not kind of, they, it's about something about grandeur. Mm -hmm. And again, this is still something I'm trying to figure out why I think this. I'm trying to feel out what I'm trying to say, which is a great thing for a professional author to think. Yeah. I, love, I love that. I love seeing people think live, <laughs> if, if you will. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. it's interesting that you say that. Like, obviously, Wasp of Shadows is the one I've read most recently, so it's the one that's on my mind. But you know, your main characters in this one almost come across to me as secondary characters who got center stage for once. And that's, that's kind of what I'm always trying to do is like, just people who feel ordinary and they're important because of proximity, not because of like, the handsomest man in London, right? Like, I find that guy super boring. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I loved the fact that, you know, you had in, in this one, you had the young revolutionary kind of pair and you mm -hmm. had, you know, the, the dashing sea captain and his, you yeah. know, husband, essentially. They thought of each other as husbands, right? And then you had these two middle-aged ladies who were sort of quite often discounted by the people around them, but relied on as well by the people around them yeah. um, in interesting ways, who are the centre of this story. And it's it's such a lovely thing because <laughs> I think like that there's a trope in romance isn't there of like oh she's the ordinary girl who the the reader is supposed to be able to identify with and so yeah. not as much now perhaps but certainly sort of in the past there was this kind of idea of the generic heroine that, that pops up quite a lot yeah um, who isn't identifiable with at all she's a she's a void and I'm not saying oh, yeah. most people the, the relatable heroine, the the Bella Swan problem. People talk about it, like yes, or yeah. even you know, like the the plucky heroine, the one yeah. that's different from other girls' heroine. I mean, that's more sort of like 20th century romance, perhaps. But you know, it was such a growing up. That's sort of the romance I was reading a lot of the time. And there's this heroine who was meant to be like you, because she was the reader, um, like Bella Swan. <laughs> she was the quiet girl. Um, yeah, but, there was. There was that moment, um, I remember this very clearly, it was when Tumblr hadn't been broken yet, and somebody did a little cartoon saying like Tumblr girl versus Facebook girl, and like Facebook girl was like fake tanned and tube topped and on Instagram and making duck face into the phone selfie, and Tumblr girl was like pale and bookish and brunette and anxious and like... And they were trying to like, it was clearly somebody trying to set up like how Tumblr is thoughtful and Facebook is not. But then like one of the very first comments, somebody went, anybody else think they should make out? And the next, that within 24 hours, there was, Tumblr was just flooded with fan art and fiction and stories about these non-characters that that were had meant like had been created as kind of like in competition with one another and now they're like best friends and making out and they're girlfriends and like literally within the space of a single day people took this and just ran with it and i think about that a lot because um this idea of like not like other girls it was such a great way to break it that like no 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 girl is like other girls but also every girl is like other girls like and we can use as inclusive a definition of girls as you please that this is yeah um and a lot of a lot of ladies guide is about discovering a secret community of women that you had no idea existed there's a scene in the library where lucy's going through and she's re she's finding all of these side notes um 
that indicate women have been trying to do this work for forever. They just keep getting written out somehow and they keep getting forgotten about. Uh, and it's, it's kind of interesting because people will point out that ladies got, that Lucy is uh, uh, a little bit based on uh, Caroline Herschel, which is true, but she's far more specifically based on a woman named Mary Somerville, who most people don't remember. But she was, she translated Laplace's French work into English. She did an expansion. It became Oxford's standard test for, or text for celestial mechanics for like 70 years. But everybody's like, oh, well, Carolyn Herschel, she was the first. And I'm like, but also Mary Somerville textbook tutored Ada Lovelace in mathematics. <laughs> like there's, there's, a, there's a genealogy here and, and it gets forgotten about even by people who are trying not to forget. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's something that I come across a lot as well. And I, I find the sort of, this was the first person narrative often quite irritating because it is often an erasure of people who went before um, yeah. in different ways and yeah it's a very frustrating narrative because it's so often wrong <laughs> when, we're, when we're talking about it but yeah and like people say oh Carolyn Herschel was the first woman to be paid as an astronomer and I'm like a she was paid as her brother's assistant and b Hypatia of Alexandria probably like would have considered herself a professional but yeah. like yeah yeah it's, it's a weird one it's also I, I was seeing on twitter the other day there was um there was a, a viral post going around about i think it was an article from the guardian or something about the first blue collar professional woman writer and i was like that's not accurate no like, <laughs> the first I mean, professional I'm woman sure. writer was like in the early 1600s and she was also a working class woman yeah so and even then, like, a couple of centuries. wasn't there, isn't there like some female scribe from like ancient Sumeria who signed a tablet at one point that we just discovered? The like, first written, the first like writing is from a woman. Yes. Essentially. And, you know, like there's this whole, it's, it's strange the way as well that class still affects things and is often ignored that like the, you know, the first professional woman writer is often talked about as being Afro Ben, but it wasn't. It was earlier than that, but it was women writing um, almanacs, so ast astrological works, <laughs> and yeah. um, also writing, you know, like um, household and housekeeper uh, guides and stuff. But that's professional writing work that they were doing. Yeah, it's and, just it wasn't fiction or plays or theater or poetry or. So you know, but we can still like the history goes back further as if you just remember to include <laughs> some working yeah. class women as well as your you know and also yeah. if you also move slightly out of the the british centric or the anglo-centric or the western centric <laughs> framework as well it's like oh <laughs> wait a second oh hang on india's right there and china is right there and oh my god <laughs> like oops yes we have actually just ignored a swath of people um, yeah like yeah oh Someday, someday, like, someday somebody will write me, I don't think I'm up to this task, but someday somebody will write me the Ottoman Empire historical romance of my dreams. Like, six book series. <laughs> don't care what time frame, your pick. Like, Amazing. My book dream is probably for somebody, because my, my thing is descent, you know, and either I want somebody to do me a series of 17th century radical descent <laughs> so like I want them to be yeah. ranters I want them to be diggers I want them to be anarcho-communists you know like yeah. I want that Cat um, Sebastian's trending that way I mean the Georgian I, yeah. the kid, like kid <laughs> web was just taking little steps I'm very excited <laughs> I also want a Unitarian romance um and I want it to oh, be God, like yeah I, I mean there's so much you could do with that I'm like come on guys but you know, this is my this is my mission. If I just keep throwing it out into the universe, it'll happen. It'll happen for me. <laughs> write it myself? No, <laughs> somebody else write it for me, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, what for you was the hardest thing with writing these these books? Um, was it sort of the research or um, the planning? What was what was sort of what's the the, the thing that has been the most challenging, but perhaps most rewarding as well? You know, 
That's hard to say. Some of it is a little bit getting over my own like internalized biphobia that I'm not allowed to write about two women being together and, you know, making love and fucking, honestly. Um, sorry, I don't know what our position is on swearing, but it's fine. <laughs> so <Sometimes. children. laughs> I, I know, to be honest, I feel like author interviews with romance writers is probably if if you're watching this video you've probably seen you're, that you're going to be comfortable with them yeah um hmm. but um yeah so um that sense that because i haven't dated a woman in real life i'm not allowed to write about two women falling in love and i'm not really like experienced enough in the physical aspects of that and i'm like well but I was writing romance long before I was having sex. I was reading romance long before I was having sex. Like on page sex is not the same as real life sex. And they they inform each other, but like also using that as a limitation was something that I was like that I'm that I'm still kind of struggling to get over. That and I have had a few a few critiques of people saying oh yeah she writes she writes queer sex like a straight girl and i'm like sure i guess maybe point me to the passages that indicate that like it's very it's very hard um at the same time uh i'm having i had uh, the first time i sat down to write a sex scene for a ladies guide i was like oh okay, I don't know, maybe this will feel weird. And then I remembered I had put off reading FF Romance for a long time because I'm like, oh, uh, well, I'm straight. Maybe this will feel weird, right? Like MM Romance, you know, I know I'm attracted to dudes. I know I don't have a problem with that. But FF Romance, I'm always like, oh, maybe I won't like that as much. Maybe I won't find that as interesting. And then I picked it up and I'm like, oh, oh no. Oh no, this works. Oh, and it's a lens that, now is making a lot more things clear to me and I'm like oh this is a mirror I'm looking into and then I'm it turns out that despite all my worries writing about two women falling in love and caring for each other and touching each other does it does feel familiar in a way it feels it feels just as easy as writing about a man and a woman like with the exception of the fact that there really is no great term for women's genitalia. Like they're just, oh, it's, it's just it's always going to make somebody, you, no matter which one you pick, somebody's going to hate it. So yep. you just have to pick the one you hate. Most. Like it's, yeah. Like men, you have like a whole panoply of wonderful choices. And it's like- And awful no. ones as well. And awful ones as well. Yes. You, but you have the range of good and awful as <laughs> yeah. opposed to just- less off <laughs> yeah like it's, yeah. it really is an issue i've read a lot of books where i'm just like oh, i wish you hadn't made that choice <laughs> like, yeah but historical terms you know you've only got you've only got so much that you can work with and none of them none of them were good <laughs> yeah none of them none of them are going to get by none of them are frictionless mm -hmm. like give me a good historical word for clitoris like honestly and it doesn't it doesn't exist <laughs> and i've read a lot of historical smut looking for one <laughs> please no. and of course like even then like i start to i start to over, i i overthink everything you'll be shocked um i start to think well maybe the, the focus on the actual mechanics of the genitalia is holding us back in other ways like you know um i have read some really excellent trans romances lately that didn't really like that managed to be graceful about the mechanics without hiding them, without veiling them over. And I was like, just so delighted and beyond impressed. And I'm like, we should all be learning how to do things like this. And it's, it's really exciting that there's stuff to learn. And I really wish I did not get in my own head so much about, about writing women. And someday I'm gonna go back to writing MF and it will probably be bisexual MF because honestly I love it when that happens and I haven't had a chance to write one yet. Like my current projects that that are upcoming are both um are both queer women as well. Um but uh but someday man someday I'm gonna write that hapless young bisexual man who falls in love with the disaster bisexual heroine and it's gonna be 
it's going to be great. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think like I, I do see sort of discussions in in the book community and particularly in the queer romance community, and a lot of them are quite biphobic. Um, and to me, it makes no sense whatsoever to say to somebody, oh, you can't write FF sex if you haven't had it. Because those rules simply do not apply to MF. Nobody's trying to apply them to MF ever. So are you trying to say that people are default straight? If they... Mm. It's... Mm. <laughs> it's... Yeah, and I feel... Ratchet, guys. <laughs> yeah, I felt embarrassed that it took me 35 years to figure out I was bisexual. And then I, I like counted up the number of relationships I'd had with dudes and I'm like oh it's like I can count them on one hand it just took time for the evidence to accumulate <laughs> yeah. and it's and I think that's that's part of the part of the problem with like the fact that we have like eight different queer romance literary genres going on like we have lesbic and we have gay romance and we have mm and ff and sapphic and a new term that I've seen a couple of times, Achillean. Oh, yeah. Because people are taking Madeline Miller's Song of Achilles and running with it, which as a classicist, I find both fascinating and also kind of drives me batty. But um, because, yeah, sorry, I've spent 30 years steeping in one particular definition of the term and unlearning it is an itchy process. <laughs> but, but like, um, When I first got into um, FF romance, I started reading every lesbian romance I could get my hands on. And I loved like the first three and then I smacked real hard into like one of the, some toaster oven trope type thing. And um, and like now, now it's very hard for me to go into a lot of, a lot of lesbian romance publishers and, and be like, okay, but but how am I going to feel? Is this going to be just all really aggressive queer women hitting on each other all the time? Um, and like the sense that, the sense that, you know, if you're discovering lesbianism, it's finally, it's your true sexuality, right? And I'm like, but no, no, like, can we, can we not? And it's, it's very frustrating. It's it's frustrating in the same way that you'll see somebody say, oh, we're an LGBTQ publisher, but all they do is publish MM. Yeah. And, you know, every book has its readers, right? But it can be sort of difficult to navigate the things that you're looking for and the things that don't exclude you as well. Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, I feel like um, all of your books have felt very... Um, open and I think as well not tentative but there's space for uncertainty and a lack of labeling which I appreciate as well in sort of some of the characters lives you know the focus is on the relationship and who they're with and what they're feeling rather than um you know saying well this is my you know I've joined a different team now <laughs> like yeah. Um, yeah, and I think I think partly that does reflect my own journey. Like, I do appreciate the label bisexual. It's been very affirming for me. But um, I don't know, maybe this is partly coming from the fact that a lot of the romance I've read has been, because lesfic started to feel like hostile for a time, I got really into reading like trans romance and queer romance and a lot of... Um, I swear to God, there is like this cluster of bisexual romance writing that's been kind of happening somewhere between the traditional queer publishers and the traditional like heterosexual publishers. There's like this thing in the middle that people are starting to do where they're like, no, well, we want something a little between. And that's where like you get, I think Casey McQuiston is operating in this space and a lot of um, Kit Rocha's stuff and um, Alyssa Cole and Courtney Milan kind of, um, and so many others. Like, uh, I think I would put Zen Cho here, like kind of this, and uh, Kat Sebastian, obviously, basically this whole panel, but um, <laughs> <laughs> this, this sense that people are coming, coming up through, through places like traditional romance and fanfic and self-pub romance and 
they're kind of creating something that is queer that borrows from queer romance but isn't necessarily uh part of that queer romance tradition in the same way okay that's interesting I, yeah like it i don't know i've also been doing a lot of research on lesbian pulps from the 50s and Amazing. the connection the connection from those with les, lesbian romance is actually like fairly direct and it's really interesting like you get your your ann bannons and your patricia highsmiths and all of that good stuff but that's very different than like um you know a kj charles well maybe not so much a kj charles she's into i think she reads more dean street press mysteries than anybody else i know but uh but this this kind of a developing genre that hasn't even given itself a name yet okay. other than other than like queer romance i mean i i like the you know there's obviously lots of debate and we're not trying to say that any particular Sort of writing choices are wrong or there's not an audience for that for that fiction right. but it's a case yeah. of you know queer romance feels quite inclusive to me and it's about breaking the world uh, or breaking down the world and breaking down assumptions in a in a particular way and in quite an open way which i appreciate and there's you know i appreciate the way in which there is a kind of queering of gender and a queering of sexuality in these texts. It's yeah. a, it's broader than simply, oh, it's two men in love or, um, yeah, you know, which. Well, and, and yeah, and like the, uh, like the, the traditional queer presses feel related to me to like, um, queer civil rights history. So your things like Stonewall and pride parades. And these are, these are spaces that have been important queer spaces but those spaces also tend to leave out a lot of people, both intentionally and unintentionally. Like um, you hear disability activists talk about pride being inaccessible. And so where are all the queer disabled people? What are they, what stories are they telling? Um, and so, so I like the idea that, I do like the idea that, um, that we can have multiple queer spaces. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I think that's, that's, the joy of it that we can have multiple spaces that we can go in and out of and find the ones that are sort of comfortable safe and welcoming to us right. yeah because we all like yeah there's no there's no one queer experience so how could there be one queer voice very true yes <laughs> yes very true <laughs> um yeah and we don't want to sort of impinge on anybody's kind of expression of their reality and uh, right experience definitely um yeah the, uh, the first time i saw somebody use the term achillean um i thought they were speaking just of like like the written genre and i was like oh my gosh what a terrible oh this is bugging me and then they're like well i i identify as that and i'm like i am a jerk i am like this i apologize profusely this is like wow that was not what i what i thought was happening but um and so like language has to evolve like that is if there is one queer experience i think it's language has to evolve <laughs> yeah. yes i feel like we could probably all agree with that <laughs> <laughs> um it's been a really fascinating chat um i'm going to sort of round us up at the end and just a couple of questions this, these are the questions i ask everybody who comes uh to to speak with us and it's mm -hmm. just kind of to get a bit of an idea. I mean, one of them I've sort of already asked, but I'm going to ask it at the end as well. But what is your sort of, uh, what was your entry text into reading romance for you? Uh, well, I don't remember my first Regency, but my first ever romance was Joanna Lindsay's Warrior's Woman, okay. which I stole <laughs> from my mother's bookshelf at the tender age of five. Oh my gosh. Which I would not recommend. <laughs> because uh, nobody wants to explain orgasm denial to a five-year-old. So she took it away as she should have done. And I had to wait until I was old enough to have a library card till I could finish the book. <laughs> but it was, it was great. I mean, I'd seen Star Wars by then. So I'm like, yeah, spaceships, barbarian planets, fights, like falling in love. Like, sure, this tracks, like, that makes sense. Oh dear. Um, so, yeah. I, I feel like my first romance reads as well, possibly my grand's Mills and Boons. Mm -hmm. I remember she used to have a stack of them in the sort of in the lounge. And I would, whenever I was visiting the house, I would 
whenever I went to the loo, I would take one and read one on the loo and be like gone for an yeah. hour. <laughs> Just oh, yeah. reading my little book. <laughs> <laughs> and then whenever I came back, I'd read the rest of it, see what happens. And I mean, like there's so many things you pick up as a child or a teenager from those kind of romances where you're like looking back, I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. And you're a kid, you're like, ah, grownups are weird. What are you going to do? And you move on. And then looking back, you're like, oh definitely there's a loads of things as well where i just kind of assimilated into my world oh, okay cool that's normal then right and now i'm like yeah. nope it was not normal <laughs> it turns out <laughs> yeah. um i'm not trying to kick shame or anything there guys but if any of you have read a lot of 80s and 90s romance you might know what i'm talking about <laughs> like lots of things that aren't normal i just read a book recently oh, yeah. where like she kidnaps him uh, he kidnaps her because he doesn't want her to get married to another guy and i'm like mm -hmm that's not healthy <laughs> no, no not not so much with the kidnapping no <laughs> let's that's not an expression of love <laughs> you know all those all those classic Bertrand smalls where somebody like gets drugged in 19th century paris and has an orgiastic experience kind of a thing like just because i guess <laughs> yeah um my second question is three recommendations from you of um, sort of writers working in romance or queer romance or Regency romance that you would recommend or that you're yeah. kind of still influenced by or. Um, well, I wasn't I wasn't joking when I said like everybody on this panel. So um, setting those aside. Um, Alyssa Cole basically whatever genre she's writing in I'm going to be reading it she's an amazing author it, it's gotten to the point where I'm like oh thriller that sounds terrifying sure I'll dive in even though like normally with thrillers and romantic suspense my anxiety is sky high so um I, it takes a lot of trust for me to follow an author somewhere somewhere uncomfortable and Alyssa Cole is just like yep yeah, just anywhere she's going I'm, I'm coming along for the ride um Anna Zabo has a rock star romance series that is criminally underread. Like the Twisted Wishes series is some of the best writing about music that I have ever seen, specifically in a rock star context, which is very, very hard to do. Like I really love, I really love rock star romances in theory, but a lot of them like kind of fall short in the execution for me. And hers, uh, theirs just blow me absolutely out of the water. They're kinky, they're um in like queer and trans inclusive they have subtle little touches of genius like the third one has a it's it's a bodyguard rock star romance with a um trans mask bodyguard and the villain is stalking the bassist heroine um and everything is very like kinky and everybody's really like like she does she does the best like um uh sorry, pronounce which, they do the best um, when you can dominate somebody in a cafe using just a like slice of lemon meringue pie, you know your kink game is on point. Like this is the kind of thing where it's like anybody, anybody can be a dom in a dungeon with all the equipment, but like getting those same power dynamics to play out in terms of like withholding a bite of dessert, ooh, that's good to read. And the um, third book in this series, um, there is a stalker stalking the heroine. And it, it, it took me like until the very end where I realized they never give this stalker a name. It's, it's a very like intensely powerful, small thing that could go so unnoticed, but in a romance with a trans character, the villain does not deserve a name. And it's, I'm still thinking about that. It may be one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen an author do. And it was just staggering. And I don't know how you do that in a novel that also contains a bit of a mystery and you have to catch them. But like, wow. Yeah, yeah just right. staggering. So that was, that was two. And um, the third one, just because I finished it most recently, is Adriana Anders' um, upcoming Uncharted, which again, romantic suspense, um, but if you said something in Antarctica, I don't care how scared I get, it's going to be great. Her first one was, her first one was in Antarctica. The second one's in Alaska, but it's ice and snow, romantic suspense, and they're terrifying and 
just unbelievably beautiful. It's hard to write beautiful romantic suspense, you know, because people think, okay, let's well, choppy sentences and action scenes and punching and, and no, and she's like, she's got this gorgeous, poetic, unbelievable settings. Like, uh, your heroine has just crash landed a plane outside the hero's remote Alaska and outpost. They're on the run from mercenaries who were after them for the wrong reasons. And they're escaping out a back tunnel into a glacier cave. And the heroine steps out and it's this beautiful blue cathedral like ice dome. And I just like, I just started a ball. And it's this incredibly like danger boning bonding experience that makes no sense in any other context. And I'm like, <laughs> You could literally bleed out 10 seconds from now. You better do something about this sexual tension. This is your only chance. <laughs> and it's, they're just, they're incredible. I love them. So, so those are my, those are my three recommendations right now is Alyssa Cole, in particular, the historicals, although the modern ones as well, like, oh my God, um, how to catch, what is it? How to find a princess, the recent one, just pure charm absolute pure charm amazing thank you for the recommendations <laughs> um <laughs> gonna have danger bone as a phrase in my head for a long time <laughs> oh yeah no i didn't i didn't invent that that is i want to say Suleika snyder was the first time i heard it okay <laughs> it, i am always <laughs> vexed at texts when i'm just like because i you know i'm ace so i'm just like guys there's not time <laughs> like come on the only exception to that is i don't know if you've seen the fear street movies i have Netflix. not because they're called fear street <laughs> i mean that's very fair in the first one there is an example which is my one single breaking of the rule so far yeah um, because it's there's five of them and they couple up and then the one guy they all come back and they're like did you did you and he's like yes <laughs> he was really feeling himself in front of the mirror <laughs> just like this is my one exception to the rule <laughs> um but yes that, i mean that sounds amazing anyway that, so they sound really good and also i haven't read um i don't think i've read any antarctic slash arctic romance so it will scare you. It is really frightening. They're like, okay, now it is time to trek 300 miles across frozen ice and we have like a couple of kind bars in our backpack and our, and the enemy has helicopters. And I'm like, how? <laughs> what are you doing? It, it's, they're amazing. Um, and uh, you mentioned you were ace. Anna Zabo's first Twisted Wishes has an ace hero. Oh, that's great. I sometimes see ace heroines, but ace heroes not very often. So that's kind of cool. I love that yeah it's very it's very thoughtfully like it's just it's just beautifully done they they dive into what it means and how it's like you know that's really or he's cool. is he ace and arrow definitely definitely arrow i definitely i think yeah he might be arrow and not ace i'm forgetting exactly where the split is it's been it's been a few years but it's um i'll dive in top notch, top -notch work <laughs> Um, the last question, a little bit off piece, but it's just to sort of give people an idea of your taste so that they can get in with uh, uh, what you're reading, what you're looking at, thinking about your recommendations. And the last question is, can you tell us three films or TV series that you would recommend or that you really love that give us an idea of who you are as a, as a viewer, watcher, consumer of media? Oh, yes. Um, hmm. Leverage. I'm pretty much constantly watching Leverage. Uh, I'm constantly watching Gallivant. Okay. Uh, which... Um, I don't think oh, I know Gallivant. Oh my gosh. Let me sing you some praises. Gallivant was a two-season, half-hour medieval musical sitcom. Amazing. Already, I'm sold. It is, it is stunning work. It is absolutely one of the rare, perfect television shows that exist. Uh, it is two seasons of absolute, they managed to like wrap up, they barely got renewed for the second season. And so they were careful to like wrap up all of the things, mm -hmm. but this is a magnificent, um, completely silly, wonderful, like medieval musical. So like everything you like about the princess bride, but like brought forward 
like progressively it's it's just it's so lovable and it's so heartwarming and it's charming and the songs will get just live in your head forever and it does it does kind of unpack you know what it means to be a hero what it means to be a villain what it means to be um you know in love while singing and dancing and making jokes about torture <laughs> like classic yes <laughs> yeah, it is it is completely ridiculously fun uh so leverage gallivant and the amanda root and siren hines persuasion always and forever Wrong. just the <laughs> The long, slow sadness of it. <laughs> like, that is true. I mean, Persuasion is my favorite, but I like the other one. I mean, sue me, <laughs> you know? Rupert Penny. Uh, which, which is the other name one? name I can never remember. And oh my gosh, how have I forgotten her name as well? I'm a terrible person. The, the, no, but the, but the new who won the Oscar for the monster, sea monster <laughs> love story movie. All the names are gone. <laughs> Oh, um, Guillermo de Toro? Well, that's the movie she was in. Um, I'm literally... Wait, she was Anne Elliot in A Persuasion? Yes, she was. She was the, in the not. Rupert Penry, uh, what's it one? Rupert Penry well, Jones. I don't know why I can never remember his name, like a Muppet. Now I know what I'm watching later tonight. <laughs> because... um, Sally Hawkins, we just, yeah, we... there we go. Sorry, yeah. Sally Hawkins, um, you were amazing and she is amazing we just finished watching paddington one and two and i'm like oh hooray i love her she was yeah she was Anne elliot and yes i would like the just i love it i loved her in the role um just a great just a great adaptation yeah i think we have another persuasion coming up um yes but i don't know who is playing captain wentworth is that out yet I don't think so, but it was, it's Henry Golding as not Captain Wentworth, and I'm so disappointed. Yes. I know, like, I, no. I saw Henry Golding, I was like, oh, Captain yes, Wentworth. Please. And I'm like, no, he's playing no. the cousin, isn't he? Like, yeah, he's playing Mr. Elliot, how, I believe. How is, like, how is, how is the Captain Wentworth going to hold up? I mean, they better bring no. up Dev Patel, do you know what I mean? There's no way, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's doomed. Maybe if they cast Dev Patel as Captain Wentworth, then maybe, but like, but they didn't do that either. Um. <laughs> Um, that would but, be a great uh, reveal though like especially now like riding the crest of the green knight right this is his moment come on <laughs> like, um anyway yes <laughs> yeah, but the, they got they got somebody to play sir walter uh richard e grant is playing sir walter and i may, i think i think he's playing sir walter he's either sir walter or he's admiral croft and i don't care which one i'm gonna die of happiness i feel so. like i i mean I, he could play either but like so Walter would just be like yeah just like absolute absolute yeah because I grew up with Richard E. Grant as um the Scarlet Pimpernel yes you know and like bringing that energy but making it real if that makes sense yeah. you know his persona becomes real uh, know, perfect. that is that is such a good Pimpernel like it doesn't quite top out the prettiness vibe of the Anthony Andrews Jane Seymour Ian McKellen because like you can't argue with that hotness trifecta no like people I mean, talk about the mummy being excellent bisexual representation and it's like but also the scarlet pimpernel where you just kind of like everybody's so attractive that you can't even stand it <laughs> i mean i i grew up with jane seymour as dr quinn medicine woman yes and and also in that <laughs> bond film um <laughs> whichever one she was like a oh, uh, yeah oh, and i was man. like she i don't know i grew up i saw i must have seen her when i was very young you know and she seemed like a, a much older than me lady <laughs> obviously she actually wasn't at the time but you know when you're five everybody looks about 80. <laughs> yeah and then i i went back and watched jamaica in that she was in in the 70s and i was like this is the most beautiful woman i've ever seen <laughs> yeah she's stunning like she's yeah. just incredibly gorgeous yeah like that is an unfair amount of beautiful right there on the screen <laughs> yeah you just tone it down jane seymour <laughs> Now, when Mr. Waite and I got together, one of the things that I, because he was already into period pieces, and so we started trading period pieces. And so, like, we connected on things like Anthony Andrews, because I came in with the Scarlet Pimpernel, and he came in with Brideshead Revisited. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, a good combo. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. 
thanks for, for joining us. It's been a really nice chat. Um, and thank you for the recommendations as well. Uh, we will be awaiting on tender hooks for the persuasion casting, I feel. <laughs> Seriously, I want I want to see that now, but I have an older one to watch in the meantime. Perfect. Anyway, so thank you so much for joining us. Do look in the chat below, guys. Not the chat, that's the wrong word. Look in the box below and you will find um, the information about the conference. So if you're wanting to come to the conference and see the queer queering hair panel, um, then you can come and find us there. So thank you so much to Olivia and goodbye, everyone. <laughs>